All right, setting up the Facebook live stream. Which, by the way, we've had great numbers with. Oh, it's been interesting how many folks have been watching these. Nice. Almost there. Okay. All right, we are live on Facebook, so we've got that set up. Um, so yeah, we'll go ahead and get started. I want to welcome everyone to our uh, Shelter Series event. My name is Clarissa Goodland. I'm the Communications Director at Preservation North Carolina. So during this time when sheltering has become a central part of our lives, we wanted to create a space um, to connect with you to explore the culture, architecture, diversity and stories of the many buildings and houses that serve as shelters across our state. This is one of several uh, shelter series events scheduled for this year and you can register for um, any of our upcoming events on our website at preservationnc.org. Uh, this afternoon, we're really excited to present uh, the Gaudette Hotel. And today's panelists are uh, our PNC Regional Director Maggie Gregg, um, our PNC President Meyer Howard, historian David Seselski, and Stephanie Dalway, um, who is a granddaughter of the Gaudette Hotel owners, Henderson and Lucy Gray Gaudette. Um, so I'm just gonna go over uh, the bios of our, our panelists, um, give you guys a couple of webinar FYIs, and then we'll, we'll turn it over. Um, so David Soselski has written several award-winning books and hundreds of articles about history, culture, and politics on the North Carolina coast. His most recent book is A Fire of Freedom, April Abraham Galloway and the Slave Civil War. He divides his time between two places he loves deeply, Durham, North Carolina, and his family's home place in Carteret County, North Carolina. His writing focuses passionately on telling stories from his little corner of the world that illuminate American history more broadly. Dr. Soselski was recently the co-recipient with Tim Tyson of the NC Literary and Historical Association's Crediton Award for Lifetime Achievement. Stephanie Dalway was born and raised in White Plains, New York, but spent many summers and holidays at the Gaudette Hotel. She fondly remembers her grandmother cooking meals in the big kitchen and playing with her cousins on the piccolo near the bar. For Stephanie, the building was not the Gaudette Hotel. It was her grandparents' house. For the past few years, Stephanie and other members of the Gaudette family have worked tirelessly to save the Gaudet Hotel. With the help of Preservation North Carolina, the family has successfully stopped a planned demolition by the town of Beaufort. On a professional level, Stephanie is an influential leader with over 15 years of leadership experience. She represented one of the largest private universities in the country, is campus director for University of Phoenix, Columbia campus, and currently serves in a leadership role for Bank of America. Um, so before I turn it over to our panelists, I just kind of want to quickly go through um, how the webinar will work and how you all will be able to uh, ask questions. So I'm gonna do a share screen here. And let's see if the slide show. All right. Um, so, as you can tell, everyone is muted and your video is, is disabled except for our panelists. Um, so we can't hear you or see, see you, but we know you're there 
and we thank you all for coming. Um, we're recording this, uh, so it's streaming live on Facebook, and we'll also save that recording to share later on our digital channels, on our website, and our social media. If you're having any technical issues, if you'll please utilize the chat function and we'll do our best to help you. Um, we're delighted to have other attendees um, assist. So if you see somebody with the issue in the chat and you know how to, to fix it, absolutely respond. We really appreciate that. Um, we're gonna go through the, the webinar presentation, the, the interview, and we want folks to hold their questions to the end. Um, by that, we'll actually give you an opportunity to, to ask and answer questions. But you can utilize the, the Q&A button um, if you think of the question in the moment and want to go ahead and get it submitted. So um, down there at the bottom, that black bar that I have showing are the buttons that you all as attendees should have available to you. So you can click on the Q&A and then type in your question. You could do that anonymously or you can use your name. If you use your name, then I'll, uh, I'll say it. And you can also um, use a chat to ask your question. I prefer if you guys don't mind to do the, the Q&A, it's kind of hard to manage um, questions that, that are in the chat just because they um, move, move up as, as comments are made. So um, if you can use a Q&A for your questions. Um, and then you can also raise your hand um, when the Q&A begins and I'll uh, click on you and allow you to um, speak and unmute you and you can ask your question live. And at the end, there is a, um, a survey. If you guys would, it should pop up on your screen right after the, the session ends or what you leave. And we really appreciate you guys taking just a few minutes to take that survey and answer questions for us. It will help us um, improve and understand what we're doing well. And then also if you have thoughts on other topics that you might be interested in seeing, we'd love to hear about that as well. And then finally, I wanted to give you guys an opportunity to hang out with us a little bit afterwards. I know that we know that the webinar doesn't really allow folks to um, interact. And, and part of this is being able to connect with you and a lot of you folks that are with us at PNC know each other. Um, so if you want to just kind of hang out with us, if you have, you know, other questions or just want to see some friendly faces, um, please join us in the, um, the, the webinar after party. Um, so the link there is uh, for, the, for the, where you can go to, to meet us on Zoom. You should also have that link in the reminder email that you got um, yesterday and about an hour before this started. And I will also put it in the chat. Um, so you'll have it in a few different places. Um, so we just exit out of this webinar and then put that link in your um, browser and, and you'll be all set. Uh, I think that is it. And now I'm going to stop sharing the screen and turn it over to our panel. Okay, I, I'll, I'll start things out by putting in this into context from a preservation <laughs> standpoint. Um, as many of you know, Preservation North Carolina gets involved with endangered historic properties around the state, trying to find new ways of putting them into, into use, new ownership, whatever, to save them. Uh, we jokingly call ourselves the animal shelter for historic buildings in North Carolina. And a few months ago, we got word of an important African-American resource in Beaufort, that was endangered and we started digging in to try to find out what the situation was and whether we could handle it. So in terms of presentation, we're going to just start out with David talking a bit about the hotel and then Stephanie talking a bit about the family and I'm fully expecting the two of them to uh, talk back and forth quite a bit um, and feel free to interrupt each other. This is intended to be uh, more a conversation than lecture, and I will prod with uh, questions here and there, particularly if, if it starts slowing down. So David, talk a little bit about the hotel if you would. Sure, my First off, I just wanted to say how nice it is to be here um, with Stephanie, um, but of course also with you, Myrick, Maggie, uh, Clarissa, um, 
I've been a fan of Preservation North Carolina's work for many, many years. And if anything, um, our experience in what I've watched happen with the Gadet Hotel over the last couple of months has, has almost been awe-inspiring. Uh, and maybe particularly because it's happening in COVID times and so many people are struggling to find ways to make a significant contribution, make this a better world, uh, despite the limitations. And um, I don't know how you've done it, but um, it, it has been um, inspiring. And uh, um, I'm uh, hoping to go to school <laughs> off of y'all. <laughs> um, uh, I came at the uh, history of the Good Hotel in two ways. Um, uh, one is, a, is as a professional historian, and the other is, is more personal. And um, I think we'll get to the more personal side of things later. But um, as a historian, uh, members of the family had approached me some months ago uh, about the threat to the Gadet Hotel. Uh, the Gadet, Gadet Hotel is located on a corner uh, uh, close to downtown Beaufort, North Carolina not far from where I grew up, uh, built sometime 1946, 47, 48. Uh, it is one of the oldest and last surviving African-American uh, buildings uh, in Beaufort. And it has a special importance as what I think today we would call it sort of as a, as, as a Green Book Hotel. In that sense, it, it, Beaufort has a very rich African-American history overall. And in some ways, I think the hotel symbolizes much of that history. Uh, and it's one of the very last buildings, one of the very few standing structures in Beaufort that speaks to that history. Um, but in particular, uh, uh, a extraordinary African-American uh, carpenter and builder, Mr. Henderson Gadet, uh, Stephanie's Grandfather, great grandfather. Great grandfather. Great grandfather. Um, uh, and um, eight of his nine sons um, uh, built a hotel uh, right after the Second World War. Uh, at that time, it was the only hotel uh, in Beaufort and uh, that catered to an African American clientele. Uh, Beaufort had tourist homes, it had a hotel, it had um, boarding houses, it had, at different times, it had resort hotels. Uh, none of them in that era, of course, would, would accept African-American customers. A vacationer couldn't come. If an African-American family was, was traveling down the coast to go see family further down the coast or anything of that sort, and they needed a place to stay, before the Gadet Hotel, they probably would have been sleeping in their car somewhere on the edge of town or in an empty lot in a church. The Gadet Hotel became this refuge, in a way a sanctuary from the, from the indignities of Jim Crow that most African-American travelers experienced. And these were quite, quite serious. It wasn't just a matter of being, if you were an African-American traveler, being left out. If you were traveling south, say on on the co you know the coastal route from Moorhead City and Beaufort down uh, uh, 24 to Swansboro, the next town, Swansboro, for most of that era, had a sign for more than for half a century on the edge of town that said, "No inward, uh, you know, uh, inward. Don't let the sun set on you." And, and it was serious. Uh, so uh, sanctuaries like the Gadet Hotel were few and far between. And as I'm sure Stephanie will explain, providing that kind of sanctuary meant not only a place for travelers to find refuge, but also a place for working people of any color really um, uh, the Manhattan fishermen, when their boats were stuck in port because of storms, the bridge builders who came and built the Graydon Paul Bridge, graduate students even from the Duke University Marine Laboratory. 
there was no other place for them to go. And, and the Gadet Hotel gave them a, as I said, a, a sanctuary and refuge. It also played, and this is the last thing I'll say, a, a, its own role, a special role within the African-American community in Beaufort. So that it was the place that you were likely to, to you might celebrate um, your 16th birthday, or you might have, um, uh, you know, the seniors at the Queen Street School, the historically African-American school, might come for a party after graduation. It was the place where people got uh, married. It was all kinds of things in the community happened there. Um, so that's it in a nutshell, and we can, we can learn more. Stephanie, would you like to just keep, keep going? Sure. So as I stated, or as Clarissa stated in my bio, for me, it was my grandparents' house. Quite honestly, I didn't know all of these fascinating things about the building until David's article. Um, and I began to appreciate the building so much more. Uh, once again, my, it, I knew it as my grandparents' house. I watched uh, my, my grandmother, my grandparents raise six children in that home, uh, several grandchildren, nieces and nephews, uh, cousins. That's where we went. Um, my mother, my grandmother cooked meals in the kitchen. My cousins and I played hide and go seek in, in the bar area, in the 13 rooms upstairs. Um, my grandmother would cook in the kitchen while we were doing all of this and call us down when it was time to eat. Uh, there were several people that would come in and out of the back door and it was just normal for us. And they wouldn't knock, might I add, they would just come in. And um, some of these were familiar faces to me, whether family or just people who frequented the hotel. I had no idea that these were fishermen, that these were bridge builders, these were very important people in the community um, that were having an impact on, on the community one way or another. Um, I had no idea of who they were. They were just people who came in and out of the hotel. I didn't know that they had no place else to go. Um, and it all started to make sense for me uh, whenever I would stay at my grandparents' house. My cousin and I would um, sleep in the same bedroom with my grandparents and uh, I didn't understand why my grandmother was very cautious about us going out in the middle of the night to one of the only two bathrooms on the floor. But now I understand there were so many different people inside and outside, or inside of the hotel. Um, there's just so many stories that I don't quite know where to begin. Um, I came uh, during my youth, the hotel had become less and less of what it was back in its heyday where I heard stories about um, the parties that would go on and uh, the piccolo, all the music that would be played on the piccolo and everyone just having a great time. My aunt shared with me how even during those times, the police would come and, and support the hotel. They would be there uh, not to enforce the law because it wasn't a reason to. Uh, the, everyone was, everyone there were law-abiding citizens just having a good time, even though they were from the African-American community. The chief of police would spend a lot of time with my grandfather. He was very, a very well-known figure in the community. Um, and he had support of the police department in the community. If I'm not mistaken, my, grand, my aunt mentioned how he would spend Sundays in the car uh, eating and laughing and joking together. Um, trying to think where else to go. Um, so that, that, that's the story of it for me, like I said. Um, and, and I didn't have an opportunity at the beginning of my statement. I do want to take a moment to thank all of the, the community members who supported us, whether it be just vocally um, or financially even. We got an overwhelming amount of support from the community when we heard that the hotel was in jeopardy of being demolished. And it, without their support, I don't even know if we would be in this place today. I think there are so many people. I 
read some of the comments that they posted in response to David's story and on, our, and on Facebook pages that they had no idea what the building was. They just knew it was this big, this huge building that took up much of the street <laughs> and they had no idea what was going on inside. Um, so I really wanted to just take an opportunity to thank them for their support. And I am happy to continue sharing some stories, whatever you wanna know, whatever I'm able to share. Um, I'm happy to do that on behalf of the family. And I, I wanna also thank Preservation North Carolina who has really stepped up and, and in a moment of great urgency, answer the call to help us save this building. Um, it's still a work in progress and we're getting there. We're just at, close to the finish line but Preservation North Carolina has been such a blessing to the family and we truly appreciate it. Stephanie, can, can, I, can I ask a question? Sure, yeah. but I have to clarify something for Stephanie. We're at the starting line, not the finish line. Oh, uh -oh. Well, the finish line for us. <laughs> <laughs> we, we appreciate you and your family being so cooperative and working with us and the, the sponsors of this particular program, Laura Benson and Walt Slava, are very are helping us a great deal with the, the financing this this purchase i mean just it was the right thing they felt like it was the right thing to do and they just agreed to do it which was 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 absolutely wonderful well thank you david thank you uh stephanie i just had a question um uh i was wondering how well you remember your your uh your grandmother lucy gray in, in so many of the conversations that you and I have had, and that when I was writing the article, when I talked to other members of, the, of your family, um, uh, people described the hotel really as, aside from being like this African-American thing, but also as like this early woman-run business in Beaufort, that, that it was owned jointly by your grandfather, Mannix Gadet, and his wife, Lucy Gray, but I know Mannix was famous for working 16 hours a day, six and a half days a week uh, on his farms. And I got the impression that kind of Lucy Gray was really the one there doing it. And I was just wondering if you could speak to that and your memories of her. Absolutely, you are absolutely correct. Um, my grandfather did spend much of the time, much of his time on the farm um, and my grandmother was the one who really ran the hotel. Uh, she was the one cooking meals. She was doing all the cleaning. And we're talking 13 rooms and the, the, I mean, a huge, huge undertaking to clean, keep that building clean, but she did it. Um, she was the one, she was the face of the hotel, really, quite honestly. And it, it's still quite odd for me to say hotel. I'll just be honest with you. <laughs> but she was the face of the hotel. She was the one that everyone came to. Um, and, and just looking back now at how strong she was to raise children. And essentially in those days, it, it was the woman's job to raise the children. And that's what she did. So she raised my mother and, and my aunts and uncles and um, some of my, my cousins who were nieces and nephews who raised them all while maintaining the hotel and making sure that the people who came to the hotel were fed, um, had everything that they needed uh, in their rooms and kept it clean, as I said. Um, but if we're speaking to my memory of her, she didn't make this look hard at all. I had no <laughs> idea all of this was going on behind the scenes. I just remember her cooking the or making, baking the handmade, uh, hand, or excuse me, from scratch biscuits that I would ask Yum. for in a big blue tub. I would just, every time I came down and I called her Ma, I said, Ma, can you please make me some of your biscuits? And she did it. And, and that's all I remember. Um, I didn't, I never knew all of the behind the scenes that she was doing that was going on because she quite frankly kept her attention on me and my cousins. Um, when we were there. So uh, I, I do recall every night helping her to lock up, 
close, close all the blinds, turn all the lights off. And um, I didn't know it until recently what it was, but she had like a cigar box where I guess she kept all of the money that she collected for the day in that cigar box. And she would always have that along with a few other things in her hands as we'd walk upstairs to go to bed for the night. Wow. That's awesome. Thank you. You make me feel like I'm right there in the kitchen. I want some of those biscuits. Oh, they were so good. I wish I could have them right now. <laughs> and Stephanie, talk about your, your, your grandfather's nickname, Mannix. Okay. So I will tell you the story I've always been told. I think there's a couple of different stories out there, but the story my mother shared with me, because we always, what is Mannix? How did it? So apparently when he was 14, 15 years old, somewhere around there, he ran away from home. Um, and the reason he ran away from home was because he did not want to wear overalls. I believe his mother uh, or his parents were, um, wanted him to wear overalls. He did not want to wear overalls and he left and kind of like that was it. And I think anyone who knew my grandfather, even, even as a youth, I, just to share the type of person he was. He was a very serious man. Um, and my grandmother and my aunts, I remember they would, they would laugh and have a good time. We'd be in the kitchen or they'd be in the kitchen. But whenever he came in, everyone had to be quiet. There was no laugh and there was no goofing off. It was serious business whenever my grandfather was in the room. So everyone would hold their laugh. And in fact, uh, I my mother would tell me the story of my aunt who smoked cigarettes. Um, she would burn the cigarette in her hand whenever he came in because he did not approve of her, of any smoking in the house. So he was just a very serious man. He didn't take a lot of junk from anyone, I guess the best word. So I think that all of that, it, what started off as the nickname Manish, he was a very Manish man, somehow through dialect and, and, and accents became Manish. So that's, that's the story that I've been told. I believe it. David, in your book, you, you refer to him as a race man. Can you, yes. Uh, can yeah. My, both kind of. Well, well, yes, and especially. Um, I mean, as Stephanie said, um, Mannix, in people's memory, does come back as this very, um, you know, to the grindstone, all business, um, maybe a little eccentric, um, in a good way. Um, aren't, we, aren't we all <laughs> some of us more than others um and um uh but one of the stories that caught my attention um uh, uh that one of the older uh, uh Gadet family members told me was uh what happened when there was a um uh, a strike down in the um at the state port the stevedores and um, in Moorhead City. And um, uh, it, that was a big thing and people didn't have food, they, you know, they didn't have money. And um, uh, Mannix's son-in-law, Charles Johnson, who later becomes uh, Beaufort's first African-American police chief, uh, was the president of the Longshoremen's Union that was on strike at the time. And um, what he and others told me w was that um, Mannix was definitely not the kind of guy to, well, probably not the kind of guy that was going to go down with a picket sign and, you know, march in front. But he let it be known that any man on strike could find a job during the strike on his farms. And that was not a small thing. Um, and it sort of tells you that kind of gesture of solidarity in that climate of had to be full of pressure and fear and everything else 
I thought was a really striking insight into what kind of man he was. Stephanie, did, did your, your, so your great, great grandfather was a carpenter of, of some considerable note, I gather. Did that, did that skill pass down to any of the children, his children, your, um, their children? Is that you or me, Stephanie? Uh, I think, you know what, David might be able to answer this better, but um, it is, it's my great grandfather. We affectionately called him Popeye. Um, his name is Henderson Godet Sr. I never had the pleasure of meeting him past before I was uh, born, but um, I know his sons uh, were carpenters. They were actually the ones who played a hand uh, in building the uh, the Godet Hotel. But David has some extra more information on the actual building of it that I'll go ahead and pass the mic to him. It's funny to like come together. Stephanie and I didn't, didn't know each other before all this started. And, and it's like we're linking these two parts of our past as every time we talk and learning from each other. Um, uh, I remember Henderson Gadette from when I was a small child. Um, my mother, my um, uh, my mother's home place uh, is a, a mile or a mile and a half from where Henderson Gadette's home was. Uh, Henderson built our barn. He built uh, and uh, refurbished the whole house. It's a it's a eighteen circa eighteen fifty. Uh, farmhouse uh, and built what's now the um, our kitchen and dining room and back porch um, and over the years I've heard many stories about how he sort of the kind of builder he was he was um, almost completely illiterate but people said it was a marvel to watch him that he would come and uh, my mother remembered seeing him uh, coming and, and the first day of a job and, and hearing the requirements of what was going to happen. And he had the sun splayed behind him in a half circle, each of whom, there were carpenters, but each of them also often had brick mason, plumber, they, they had the whole, the whole thing. And he would start going down, he would just start l listing. We're going to need this many board feet of lumber. We're going to need this many bricks. We're going to need this many dot, 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 dot. And, um, and he could build anything, um, both, um, uh, you know, the, the, the sort of arts and crafts revival work that he did uh, at my mother's home place, but also very practical, um, you know, sort of buildings, the, the red and white grocery in Beaufort or a, a bowling alley for the defense workers in, in Harlow. And he was doing that kind of thing when I, when I was a small child. Um, he would do that sort of thing. Um, I mean, if, a, if, if an elderly woman in the neighborhood's roof had flooded and a, you know, a room had largely been destroyed, he, he, would, he and the sons would just show up and start, start building. And in fact, <clears throat> When, when he showed up at our house and built the back part of our house, they never took for that. They were never asked to do it. My grandfather had died in a, a very tragic accident and he and Henderson, Mr. Henderson were close. And he, Mr. Henderson and the sons just showed up one day and, um, uh, and got to work. They, ne they never asked my grandmother, my grandmother could barely face her husband had just died. Um, my mother says she went inside and got my grandfather's old toolbox and said, this is all I have to give you, Henderson. Um, they spent four months on that project and, uh, and didn't take a cent for it. Well, and David, if I can jump in for just a second, you made reference to you and Stephanie's connection 
Um, but, but just for those who don't know what that connection is, would you share that for us? Family connection? Uh, uh, Henderson Gadette was my great uncle. Uh, uh, in, in, the, um, in the 1880s, my great grandfather and uh, Henderson's mother had uh, three or some people say four children together. Uh, her name was Nancy George and she was a midwife in what's called the Craven Corner community, which is a historically a free, a free African-American community on the edge of Craven and Carteret that has been free and had land, most of the families since the 1740s. And um, that's the tradition that Mr. Henderson came out of, that's the tra tradition that Mr. Mannix and that Stephanie, and that I have um, been privileged to be part of. Um, uh, uh, as Stephanie knows, over the last 20 years, we've been working to bring together the black and white sides of the family. Um, most of that side always, all of that side, the older people, all knew this. My side, the white side, was left in the dark for two generations. So, um, uh, but my grandfather and Henderson uh, looked alike, spent almost you know, eight Sunday dinner together, my grandfather at Mr. Henderson's house every week with my grandmother. Um, Stephanie, will you, will you forgive me if I tell one quick story? No, go for it. You sure? <laughs> um, um, go ahead. Well, just a little sign of like how they, how they were together. My mother told, remembers when she was, remembered when she was very, very young how the two of them were and that when, when it was just her in a room and uh, she was very small, two years old, three years old, they would talk to each other eye to eye, face to face, they'd argue politics, they bought farm equipment together. They'd say, you know, we only need one donkey. Okay, you, you have it this day, you have it this week. They planned things together. Mr. Henderson wasn't, was a multi-complex man. He had the farm, he was a master carpenter, he had a little store. Steffi, can I mention his other business enterprise? Sure. <laughs> um, he was a bootlegger on an um, industrial scale. Uh, and um, though I don't think he drank at all. And uh, that's kind of what our community was famous for um, anyway, but my mother remembers how they were like that by themselves in a room, but if another white person came in the room, they switched. And my grandfather would start sort of talking, being the white guy, he would start talking down to Mr. Henderson. Henderson would avoid eye contact and would always just kind of, you know, they would do the Jim Crow shuffle in a way. You know, he would, he would agree. He would never disagree. He would never state his opinion assertively. And then when the white, other white person left the room, they'd switch right back. And they'd be like there arguing with each other and going back and forth. And if the person who left forgot their hat and came back in, they'd switch again. My mother said it was like a light going on and off. And she said it was a revelation because they thought she was so young, she wouldn't notice. But instead it was so strange it was one of her earliest memories, and it taught her very young. And I know that, Stephanie, I think we're beneficiaries, that we learned it was, that my mother learned young that it was all a charade, this whole race thing, that, 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 because here she could see it. It's there, it's not. It's there, it's not. And um, so that's the entwinement of our, of our families. Stephanie, how does that tradition follow in your family stories? So um, I, David enlightened me, quite honestly, to all of this information. Um, there had been, um, I mean, a lot of my family, including myself, is very fair-skinned. Um, 
my aunt Verdell, uh, she actually told stories about how she could pass, uh, pass for white um, back in the segregated uh, South. Um, and uh, so there was always speculation, um, discussion around the fact that, you know, we somewhere down the line, there was, uh, there were white, there were white members of our family. Um, no one exactly knew how, uh, but we just, I think the story that had been told was that um, my great, great grandmother uh, had a relationship and this is how it was basically told to me, had a relationship um, with a white man um, who, had his own family and you know all i could really do was try to put two and two together and i even shared this with david i was like i guess i just assumed that she must have been a, a slave and there was a, some sort of connection to a white man and, and did not want, he did not want um his family to know that he had children with this person that was kind of, I think, what a lot of the assumption that was made because there was, uh, at least as far as I knew, there was no um, clear story or there was no history, you know, the, it, stories get passed down and they get changed, of course. Um, but that was what was left with me. And I know my cousins and, and family members, that's kind of what we assume happened until I spoke with David and it was ex so exciting. Um, to learn. I, I love history. Um, but it, so it was, I, I told David I could listen to him for hours, but specifically about my family to understand that that wasn't the case, that they indeed had a relationship, um, a mutual relationship, a mutual love for one another. Um, and so that was, that was so in, interesting and intriguing to learn uh, David sent me a picture of, I guess he would be my great, great grandfather, um, which was awesome. I've shared it with my family members and I'm like, oh my gosh, he kind of looks like my uncle. <laughs> and so it, it's just been fascinating because um, just to take it back, to be, uh, to take it to race relations, right? the things that's going on in this country right now. Unfortunately, many black people cannot trace their history. They, they don't know, they don't, they, don't, they don't have the advantage that many other races have of being able to tell you when their great, great grandfather came to this country and what they did and um, what their name, you know, what their name means. A lot of African-Americans don't have that luxury. And so to be able to have that, it, it's, I can't even, just on a personal side, I shared it, I shared the story with my husband and he was just in awe. He was just like, that's so awesome that you can do that, that you can actually trace back that far. And um, it gives us meaning, it gives us an identity so to speak and i just feel badly for many of my friends and and my husband and people that i know of um that are african-american who cannot do that so i was so grateful and I, I don't know if david realized how much that meant to me for me to be able to know the story know the history and start putting the pieces of the puzzle together um, and to be able to tell that to my children and, and, and they can tell it to their children. So, and I'm happy to call David my cousin. He's family. A great family to be part of. <laughs> Your family, I mean, our family. Yes. And, and I do wanna be clear as, as Stephanie knows that, that, that the research and all didn't start, I mean, the way we've come back together, what didn't start with, uh, like it wasn't just me, that the Gadets are now a very large family. <laughs> And um, me and uh, uh, Ty, your cousin Ty, uh, Harold Gadet's grandchild, and I were, were originally the, um, 
uh, uh, we, we had encounters that brought us together, black and white together. And slowly we um, built outward from there. So, so um, you know, and, and we went around and talked to all the old people on both sides and we gradually pieced things together. But when we started, and Stephanie, in a way, you're, you're too young for this, in a way. When we started, there was still a whole generation of elderly African-American and white people that knew the truth. And the African-Americans were willing to tell it. <laughs> um, today, that's no longer true. I think all the people that we first discussed this with before we went in, into archives and libraries to confirm things were, um, are now gone. But, um, and once, once I was able to, to tell my elderly white cousins that I knew, they were funny. They were like, oh yeah, everyone knew. <laughs> <laughs> but, but they had been denying it for decades. <laughs> so um, it, has, it has been an adventure, but it's been a very nice thing. It's, it's nice to have more family and just with my professional historian's hat on, the cadets come from this, it's a fascinating community with strengths. They're, they're a long tradition of artisans and builders, self-reliance, um, Craven Corner and the African-American communities around it uh, a few years ago also organized the uh, uh, first predominantly African-American chapter of the Sons of the American Revolution. Our little community has something like 40% of the African-American members of the Sons of the American Revolution in the entire United States. <laughs> I know. And, and they let me be a member. Um, I'm, I'm the mascot. Uh, they, they, they found me a Revolutionary War ancestor that I didn't know I had. Um, so it's been a, um, uh, an interesting and inspiring um, Thing. And it's, it's, I get to meet new cousins like Stephanie. So it's, that by itself would have been worth it. Let, let me, from a preservation North Carolina standpoint, one, one of the things we've been watching through the years and real interested in is African-American builders, artisans, um, and we're seeing an amazing number of stories that are not that's so different. I mean, the you know, I have this virtual background is my office is in the home of Willis, home built by Willis Graves, plus or minus 1885. We've been able to find all sorts of amazing things about his 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 family. They they education was really important to them. It was interesting, Willis Graves um, would advertise his sons as, as brick masons and plasterers in the city directory while they are going to college at Shaw. I mean, it was kind of like the back, of, in case this, this, this education thing doesn't work, you still got the skills and so forth. And, you know, and with, with Mr. Godet, you're the kind of about, you know, can't read, but his, his math is extraordinary. And we're finding, you know, very interesting stories about black artisans, their relationships with the whites and all relationships in all sorts of ways. Um, you know, Valerie Jarrett is a descendant from a slave, you know, that's a carpenter on the Bellamy Mansion uh, mm -hmm. as just one, you know, extreme example. Um, but but there, there are so many more. I'm sort of curious if that, do you, do you know what, John Bell would have been Henderson Gadet Sr.'s biological father, right? Is that right? Uh, William Nashville. Uh, William would, Nashville. Would, would have been Henderson 
Gadet Sr.'s, was Henderson Gadet Sr.'s father. Yes, so my grandfather, my great-grandfather was his father. And was, was that, okay, that is going on right there. See, Mr. Gadet's born in 1889? I believe that's right. So we're, we're a quarter century after the end of the Civil War. Right. Um, is, were there any carpentry skills on the bell side of the, the family? Uh, to be honest, Myrick, I don't know. The, the bells were... Um, uh, just to throw in a little irony here, um, uh, William Nash Bell was a farmer. His father, uh, his father Rufus Bell, uh, was a was a, uh, a large planter in the area, and was um, with a turpentine distillery, a cotton gin. Um, a brickyard. Um, he was an ardent um, Confederate who was at one point imprisoned with uh, his wife's um, uh, sister, who was a famous Confederate spy, Emmeline Piggott, in Carteret County. And he named one of his um, daughters. Uh, 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 Vanessa Jefferson Davis Bell, after the Confederacy's president and first lady. Um, uh, I have no idea what kind of carpentry skills they had. Um, uh, the old people told me and, and the other Gadet cousins who were originally doing this research that Mr. Henderson learned most of his skills while, while working uh, uh, in lumber camps uh, that in, in our area uh, in the 1880s, 90s, 1910, 20, there were a number of kind of boom town lumber camps um, in, in that area. And uh, uh, apparently uh, uh, among them were, ma were, were master carpenters who were building the buildings and the barracks and things of that sort. Um, are you and Stephanie? We're, we're we're heading toward question and answer period. Any any kind of follow up thoughts from your side? Um, you know, it, it is just kind of going back to what you originally uh, were discussing as far as the importance and just kind of coming coming across a lot of these structures that have such meaning. Um, this entire uh, ordeal with saving the hotel um, is an unfortunate reminder of what little value is given to uh, historic structures, period, but specifically African-American structures. Um, it's my understanding that, uh, I'm trying to be politically correct here. Yeah, no bother. Okay, <laughs> good. Say what's on your mind, feel free. Um, whatever plans that the town had for when this building was demolished um, would have been a slap in the face to history, mm -hmm. the African American history and what this structure means to the community. This is not something, I mean, there are materials in that building that you can't even find anymore. Um, when we were getting quotes on uh, trying to repair the building, which were just astronomical, but um, when we were getting quotes, a gentleman mentioned he said, well, if you guys demolish it, can I have that wood in that, that's from the ceiling? I want that wood. 
you can't find that wood anywhere. And, you know, he said it was worth a lot of money. And I just told him, well, we don't have plans to demolish it. But my point is that um, in addition to something, you know, the materials, the memories that have been created for the Black community um, at that building, um, for there to be such little value in that, um, very little concern. Um, I, I, I get that towns and cities want to grow and that they want to be progressive and, you know, uh, and, and attract more tourists and things like that. But you can do that um, without compromising the history of the town. And um, unfortunately, it took so much to finally get the town to realize that. And I don't know that they all do. Um, I think it was a lot of pressure from the community that really made this happen. And that's why I'm so grateful and thankful for the community um, and, and so grateful for David and his article, because I think that was the other thing that really tipped the scales for us. But um, these are, this is something that you can't get back. Uh, you, there's already been some loss based on the things that they have done to the building in preparation to demolish it. But um, if it would have been a tragedy to see this building, not, not just for my family, it, it, it would have hurt us to our core, of course, to see the building go. But it would have been a, a tragedy for the, the town of Beaufort, for the Carteret County, for the, for, the, for the country, for this history to have been lost. So um, I just wanna end with that. We're, we're still in the fight. Um, we're just about there, but um, you know, we have to uh, appreciate the, historic, the historical value of properties, of buildings, of, um, you know, we have to do a better job of that. And uh, especially for the African-American, um, you know, structures. And I think there, we're living in a time where there is a heightened awareness to some of the things that the African-American community is going through. Um, you know, this is just another example of something that matters and that we need to preserve. So that's my two cents. Hey, hey Mark, okay? Mark, I was <laughs> gonna jump in. I think you guys can see I have some images in the background. Um, if you, I can kind of scroll through, because there were some requests for images, which makes perfect sense. <laughs> I can kind of scroll through if you guys want to comment. I, so a couple of these I pulled from um, David's article, um, and then let's see here. Um, so if you guys, if you couldn't, either one of you can tell us what this image is um, from. I think David, that was it was from a, I know it was from 1951. That's the Good Dad Hotel in the background. One of uh, one of Stephanie and my cousins sent this in. Uh, uh, it, it's a uh, as you can see, it's, it's the homecoming parade for, for the historically African American school in New Bern. I mean, in, in Beaufort, uh, the Queen Street School was located just up the block. As you can tell, this, the, the hotel is kind of a gathering place um, for the people watching the parade. And then I had um, these family images from Stephanie, and the other one is from um, Davis' article as well. Yes, so on the left is Popeye, also known as Henderson Godet Sr., who I never, unfortunately, I never had the pleasure of meeting. Um, I did hear that he was a very kind man, very sweet. My mother would tell stories of um, him just always smiling and giving her a big hug whenever he saw her. Um, so that was, that's my great grandfather. And uh, as you've heard, um, his father and David's is David's great grandfather. 
or grandfather, great grandfather, right? Great. Okay. Got it. So that is, that's Papa. He's the builder of the Godet Hotel. He, um, along with his sons, built the uh, structure and many other important structures in the community that I learned um, as well. On the right is my grandfather, um, Henderson Godet Jr., uh, Jr., also known as Manis. And that is my grandmother, Lucy Gray Godet, um, standing by him. Um, these were in his later years. Unfortunately, we, I don't, there aren't many photos of him um, that I've been able to locate. I don't, I would be shocked to know that he stood to, for a picture, just based on the type of man I, I knew him to be. Um, but uh, these were in his, uh, his final years when he was dealing with uh, Alzheimer's and my grandmother, the strong woman that she was, um, in addition to still taking care of the hotel and the building, also cared for him um, out, of, out, of, out of the home. Actually, there's a, the smaller house right directly behind the hotel or next to, depending on where you're, where you're looking, which way you're facing, um, was the my my grandmother eventually moved to that building, and I, I think it was largely due to my grandfather's illness uh, to be able to keep a better eye on him and to take care of him. Um, but she still very much maintained the hotel while taking care of uh, my grandfather and everything else that she did. And worth noting that we will be acquiring the house and the hotel and looking at Maggie can come back in a little bit and, or give a little bit of a pitch for the, the property. There's the house to the left of the hotel. And this is good for us to, to know more. And I had a couple of some interior um, images. Yes, so that was, um, that's the bar area. That whole area was, um, there were booths. I think the booths are still there. Um, but those were the bar stools and there used to be a cash register behind the bar that I remember playing on, very old cash register. Um, I wish my cousin was on this call. She can kind of co-sign with me because um, that, that was also one of the places we would hide. Um, <laughs> but uh, there, you know, in it, it, its day, it was a the place to be. It was the place to go if you were African American and hang out and have a good time and eat some good food and have a couple of drinks and and dance as well. Um, so that's what that's that image is showing. And that's that's the piccolo, um, which I'm hopeful that we can. And I don't know. I've heard it was called something. I don't know if it's a jukebox. I was always told it was the piccolo. Um, and my aunt <laughs> can tell you right now what song plays, what song is associated with what button. She can just tell you, oh, number 64 plays it. It's amazing. Um, but that was what uh, was played during, uh, you know, again, by the, by the time I came around, it was, you know, there were no re really no more parties. But from what I understand, they used to have a good time uh off of that piccolo so yeah is it a Wurlitzel? i is think no so. i think that is what that says on i there. think that's what it is and just to, just to kind of kidding around as a white guy piccolos in my world were little flutes oh okay. <laughs> and this is a jukebox so <laughs> it, it's been kind of fun for you know okay oh yeah okay yes it's, that's just more pictures of the bar area that's it that I, well, we've got some more. Those are the ones I kind of pulled. Unfortunately, um, as I mentioned, there aren't, um, I, I tried to find some photos for you guys, but uh, um, there there aren't many. I, again, I, I, tr I, I would love to know um, what my grandparents are thinking right now, seeing this go on. Um, you know, I don't, I don't think they would have thought this was as big of a deal as we're making it out to be. And that's what's I, hence there's not a lot of photos because for them, it was, it was just home. I've got photos of family members, but specifically of like the hotel area, not a lot, unfortunately. I, I, I bet as we work on this, things will start 
coming out of the woodwork. For example, people who may have had a wedding party there, mm -hmm. you know, the hotel will be in the background, but it will still be be there. Um, we probably need to, to go over to questions and answers, but yeah. first, Maggie, you want to do a quick, what, what happens next, as in we, we're going to be looking for a buyer? Absolutely, we will be. And so, you know, David, you sort of made reference to you, you wanted to know sort of how the miracle or magic worked here. And, and I will say it's a lot of working parts and we've really appreciated the help of the family. We've really appreciated the communication and work with the town to be able to come together and say, okay, how do we all work together? And, and ultimately that's what's necessary to save a building like this is for everyone to work together. And so we've been able to do that. Um, and we're hoping to have ownership of it within the next week to 10 days. Our attorney's a little backed up. And so we're working on that as everything goes. Um, and so once that happens, um, we will begin to market the property. Um, it, it's funny to even for me to look at the photos having been in the space. Um, you know, there's there's some really remarkable potential. I'm sorry, you guys may be hearing the thunderstorm that just decided to start <laughs> um, right outside the window. But there's there's some really remarkable adaptive reuse potential with this building. It sits in a um, newly developed mixed use neighborhood. Um, there are um, 16 rooms upstairs, um, eight on each side with two bathrooms, and, and really the possibility for development here is, is endless. That large space with the bar, um, as she mentioned at one point, historically functioned as a dance hall. Um, having those separate rooms upstairs, sitting on a corner lot, having the space for a commercial kitchen, having a great foyer entryway, um, that, that really can house some of these artifacts that are still with the property to continue to tell the story as well as making it functional for um, future uses, which is always sort of the goal with preservation is, is not only to preserve what was there, but to find a way that makes it once, once again a, a vibrant part of the community. So um, we're hoping to have that up pretty soon and, and very excited about this project and appreciate the collaboration from both sides. <laughs> Thank you. And, and Clarissa, you want to go with questions? Yeah. Um, so we've got a, a few questions. Um, the first was, well, a lot of thank you for doing this. If there are ways to help um, folks when they get involved. So I, I'll save the chat and that kind of stuff. So um, you'll have that information. But um, one is, is anyone collecting oral histories or stories of hotel guests? Are those familiar with the hotel? <laughs> <laughs> um, there's a reason David knows why I'm laughing. Um, not yet, I think is the best answer for that. Um, I pitched an idea to David because of his background and his successful background as an author um, and historian and uh, I, I, I run some things. I'm, I'm, I'm working on collecting stories, uh, especially now while I still have like my, you know, the, my aunt's great memory and some of my family members. And so um, that's in process. If there are, if there is anyone out there on the call that has a story, because I've learned a lot from the community members about their experience at the hotel. If there is something that they want to share, please send it my way. Um, I'm, I'm, I'd love to have it because I, I do want to capture all of the his, these stories and uh, about the hotel. So we're working on it. So the answer is it's in process. If you have some your own story and experience with the hotel, please share it. And, and let me say this is. One of, one of my, my things about preservation is when the buildings go away, the stories also go away. And as long as the buildings are there, there this sort of conversation can take place. And I dare say with the, um, for example, the, our office here with the, the Graves House, um, we and the family probably know a hundred times more than we did three years ago. I mean, it's been just kind of, you know, one thing leads to another, leads to another, leads to another. And uh, when the building's there, 
there's a chance to learn stuff when the building's gone. People don't respond. Mm -hmm. um, um, let's see, we had a question from um, Julianne Rose. How did she manage to maintain the hotel, the finances, and the food? I think you're referring to your grandmother. How did she manage to do that? Oh, gosh, by the grace of God, I think. Um, she, <laughs> I, I don't know. I, it's such a huge undertaking. Um, again, I, you know, for me, I didn't even realize all that she was doing behind the scenes. Um, you know, I know there were people, family members that, that helped, uh, you know, in some shape or form there, whether it be with the maintenance um, and cleaning. I know my aunt helped uh, to clean the home and um, run errands and, and do things. Uh, one of my aunts um, lived very close by. Uh, and so I know she did a lot to help my grandmother. Um, and so, I, you know, she had some help, but I guess just it's just the the strength and the just how amazing she was to be able to manage all of that and, and do it so effortlessly, or at least to us, it appeared effortlessly. But um, that's a good question. I wish she were here to answer it. <laughs> but yeah. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, we had another question um, from Charles Francis. As a native of NC and history buff, found the presentation and dialogue between David and Stephanie fascinating. Thank you. Uh, tell us about the building, the ownership, condition, square feet, location, acreage. Are there estimates to preserve um, ultimate usage you would like to see and a timeline? And then also you had a secondary question about the possibility of historic um tax credits for restoration i imagine you said some of that maggie but if you have thoughts on you know what uses stephanie or any oh, anybody can let answer. me let, let me first <laughs> let me first say hello charles thank you for your interest uh charles has been a good friend of preservation for many years thank you for your interest and charles has done tax credit projects um in, in in Raleigh, so uh, we're we're delighted with you, that your your ears up, and we can Maggie, you want to do just a quick little take, and then Charles, we can give you more. Sure. Um. So the the building's right around fifty five hundred square feet. It's located on the corner of Pollock and Cedar Street in Beaufort, which is about three blocks directly up from the waterfront and business district. So walking distance to that. Um, really nice neighborhood located between um, very central location. Um, as I said, I think there are 16 rooms total upstairs. There are two large spaces, one in the back and one in the front downstairs. And between that is what used to be the kitchen and, and is a fairly good sized space. Um, and then off to the side downstairs, there are a couple of bathrooms there currently. Um, in terms of tax credits, it is not currently listed within the National Register District. However, we've spoken with the SHPO, it is well within eligibility. Um, and so it would need to be listed um, in order to take advantage of those tax credits. But I would not think that getting this listed on the National Register would be any issue. Um, I think that should be fairly easy to do. Um, in terms of use, I mean, I certainly can lay awake at night and daydream and often do. Um, you know, anything from a, a fabulous boutique hotel to a mixed use residential commercial space. Um, there, anything you can dream, you know, there's certainly the possibility to look at a way to, to create that. And so um, we certainly love to hear new ideas and, and proposed ideas for the property and look at how that contributes to the history of the building and the use of the building and and also to the community um it is in a mixed use district so that that gives a lot of opportunity there for for multiple use and workforce housing is something that several folks have mentioned interest in in trying to perhaps put in the upper upper floors and the house um, because that, that is a real need in beaufort um, so it, it's there are a lot, you know, there are a whole lot of possibilities, and I think the tax credits would be 
very much available. Uh, you don't have to, you take a little bit of risk about it not being on the register yet, but uh, it's hard to imagine a building more eligible. So. Um, let's see. What was the uh, from uh, from Catherine Beicher? What was the relationship between the folks who owned and operated the hotel and the white leadership in Beaufort, and how was that managed? Um. Uh, that's an interesting question. Okay, so. Um, As you're taking it, I have no idea, Stephanie. Yeah, I'm. <laughs> I, I just going off of stories that I've heard, um, uh, and I don't know if I'm going in the right, if I'm actually going to answer the question, but um, <laughs> so my grandfather was, had a reputation of being, again, no nonsense, and that was on, from both sides, okay, um, the white community and the black community. He was known to be a no nonsense guy. Um, he, financially, he was he was very comfortable, um, so he you know I think earned a lot of respect from the white community because of that, um, from his farming, things like that. I mean, he he didn't uh, he was financially very stable, um, so he had this I, he didn't have much trouble with the white community. Um, I'll share, I don't know if I should share this. I'm gonna share it. <laughs> um, my mother uh, would tell me this, uh, told me a story about how um, he got in some sort of verbal altercation um, with a white man that didn't live far and apparently he went and punched the man in his face. And back then, you know, ugh. but apparently five minutes later, they were sitting on the porch together eating watermelon like nothing had happened. So I was just like, how did he get away with that? Like he just, you know, um, I was speaking to an attorney uh, and he had uh -huh stories about my grandfather as well. He, he was very well known in the community. He, he really was. So I guess, um, I don't know if this answers your question, but he may, the, at the time the building was maintained properly, um, paid taxes, things like that. So there was really no need for um, there to be in any, any outside involvement or, or you know, but um, I think he had earned the respect of the white community. I will say this too. I've always heard my family say that my grandfather was ahead of his time. The, the building, in addition to it being a hotel, like I said, it was in, in one area, you've got a bar um, where with the jukebox or piccolo. And then there's a beautiful dining room on the other side of an industrial sized kitchen. Um, uh, where they would cater weddings and the, the, the dining room uh, had these, I, even, I don't, I don't think it's still there, but there were these beautiful custom drapes. Uh, I mean, that I don't know how much they would have cost, but it was very elegant and beautiful. And I think uh, had he, had it been now or had he, you know, his ideas for what the hotel could have been, I don't think the black community, the community was able to fully support it the way that it needed to be supported for it to really evolve in what he envisioned it to be. Um, so I don't know if that answered the question. I, didn't, I found myself just talking, but <laughs> oh, uh, he didn't have any, he, he was well respected in the community on both sides. Thanks, Stephanie. We have, we're gonna do two more questions, one from the chat and then one from the, um, Q&A. And so I'll take this one uh, from the Q&A. Is the house next door going to be included in the cell of the hotel? I think, okay. Yes. Maggie's shaking her head. Yes. Um, and then from the chat, um, does the family, let me see, 
Does a family have, this is from Barry Edwards, does a family have any original furniture from the hotel? If so, will it be donated back to the restored hotel? Unfortunately, no. Um, I think over the years, the condition of the furniture uh, was not salvageable. Um, so in preparing for it to be repaired at the time, um, a lot of things were thrown out. Um, and so short answer to that is no, but we do have the piccolo and I'm so happy we have the piccolo. <laughs> and the bar stools. <laughs> and the bar stools, yes. Awesome. I, there was one final question. I'll, I'll end with that one um, about the overalls. This is from Catherine Beicher. Um, when your great grandfather didn't want to wear overalls, what did he want to wear? This is an important topic to my grandfather, a farmer who lived a long time ago. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know what the problem with overalls were. Back <laughs> I don't know. For he had apparently he had an issue with them. Um, he just he I guess he wanted to wear everything else but overalls. I, I don't know. Um, that was Manis Cadet for you. So great question. I, I wish. Even if he were here, I probably wouldn't have had the nerve to ask him, but <laughs> uh, I, uh oh, let's see, hold on. I have a, my cousin who is dialing in is, is uh, oh, she told me white undershirt and green khakis. Mm. Oh, some folks have a uniform. There you go. That, that's <laughs> what, that's his uniform of choice, white undershirt and green khakis. There you go. There you go. All right, that's all our, our questions. Um, and I'm gonna present again the link for our little Zoom after party. Um, all are welcome and Stephanie and David have time to join us. We'd love to have them there. Um, but Myrick and Maggie and I will be there and whoever else. Um, I just wanna thank you all again for being with us. Um, again, this is recorded um, and we'll have it up on our our website, um, it's streaming on Facebook, so it'll be on Facebook immediately um, after we close out. And um, yeah, I think that's it. And I wanna thank our um, sponsors again for this. Um, and so, yeah, anything? It was great to spend time with y'all. Absolutely, thank you everyone, that was wonderful. Yeah, thank you. That was, that was a terrifically interesting hour. Really do appreciate it. And hope you'll come over to the other side and join us for a, a, a virtual drink, right? Yes. yes. <laughs> and I just want to thank the, the everyone once again. I, you know, I, I can't tell you how much the family appreciates everyone's support. I, I can't, it's just words can't express how much we appreciate all of the the support and the well wishes and the you contacting the town to help us we really really thank you um we couldn't have done it without you guys thank you all right okay. bye everybody bye everybody see you in a moment you're awesome stephanie thank you all, all. <laughs> bye, -bye. <laughs> bye.